Okay, innovating and investing in sustainable tech as a mitigator of long-term inflation. That's a tough conversation, especially now. We've looked at what's happening to the pound. We're looking at the dollar. We're seeing how the whole world generally is being beaten up by the situation economically. So as we, as we start this conversation, I want us to do a couple of things. Let's take one minute to introduce ourselves, and then let's jump into the conversation of what, first of all, is innovating as far as long-term inflation is concerned, and then let's talk about investing in sustainable tech as a mitigator of that problem. Does that work? Yeah, it's good. It works. Right. Ronald, you want to go first? Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Ronald Mugega. I'm the CEO and founder of Mark Tech Brands. Uh, Ikumak is a strange enterprise that recycles plastic waste in cities and communities into construction bricks. Thank you, Thank you Ronald. Philip Kirikoff with Startup Bootcamp Afrotech. Uh, and actually, we're very honored to have Ecomac as one of our portfolio companies that came through the last cohort. Uh, we are a pan African accelerator program looking for incredible startups. Uh, and of course, climate tech is one of the ones that's most exciting for us. Uh, and most relevant for this uh, this conversation. I have so much, I have so many questions to ask about that climate tech buzzword that we are not very clear about. Other Philip, let's talk. Hi, Philip, uh, originally from Uganda, but I stay in uh, Rwanda. So to all my Kenyan friends, I want to say apologize on behalf of what's going on on the other side. He was promoted, don't worry. But um, I'm here with uh, Catapult Africa, and it's an origin venture capital fund uh, based in Oslo. Focus mainly on climate and ocean, but here in Africa, ag and climate, and I'll speak to that one as well. And uh, we got about uh, 100 companies that we invested in, and excited to be here in the continent. So I've been here the last two days, and really excited to hear what uh, we're seeing here today. Nice. My name is Tony. I am from Kenya. Very annoyed at the Ugandans because you saw what they did. For those who have no context, the, the President Museveni's son talked about how he's going to invade Nairobi and in two weeks capture the city. We found that fun because it's on Twitter. So we're like, okay, cool. Okay, this is our crazy brother on the side here. Um, let's talk about the the the, the innovation um, that the angle of innovation on long term inflation. Just innovation. Let's talk about. Let's not talk about the companies and what they do, but let's talk about what can we do to innovate when it comes to long term inflation. Period. Remove the tech. Remove the climate change. Just innovation and long term inflation. How can we do it? And I will just I just want to caveat that by saying when cryptocurrency became popular post 2008, that was one of the biggest um, I think logical drivers for most people because unlike gold, mortgages, housing, real estate, crypto seemed to be outside the fiat system altogether. It was extremely volatile. A lot of people have been losing and lost, but a lot more people won, and especially in the battle for a positive. Uh, I would say brand for crypto versus the dollar. So, talk about in, innovate. Uh, talk about innovation and long-term inflation alone. Then we get into uh, what is sustainable tech. Philip, let's start with you. Well, I'll start by saying it's it's no longer a fad. Uh, I think today, uh, since 2018, uh, asset managers around the world have moved from 23 trillion US dollars to 50 trillion US dollars under management. That are now focused on ESG, so that it is moving that direction. There's this bus left, um, but I think in terms of what you innovate, I think when you talk about innovation to, particularly in the inflation to the average man on the ground, is look, my bread that used to cost uh, 100 bobs is now 150 bobs. Yeah, right. Yeah. That is the basic of it. And I think yesterday we were speaking with Philip is what goes into that bread from your just supply chain to your cost of goods to your financing, everything that goes in. Is there a space to innovate in the, uh, within there? And I think there's an opportunity just to reduce those kind of uh, those kind of costs, and we're seeing a lot of that. But I, I still do believe there is a big challenge because there is uh, a huge cost to doing that right now, yeah. uh, and we haven't yet seen too many um, managers on the continent focus on that because it, it takes a while. Um, yeah. So I, I think there is that that opportunity there. Sure. So I, I think. You know, inflation is is more of an economic concept, and I, I certainly would be far outside of my depth talking about that. But what but what's clear from a trends perspective is that, uh, especially when you look at things like food, fashion, you know, transport, everything, that the pre up until now the the carbon impact of these consumer behaviors and corporate activity has not been priced in. So you know, a, a particular topic, 
that's that's very near and dear to me, but is very unpopular in Africa is is meat consumption. And we know that you know that historically that, that meat consumption is a huge contributor to climate change and carbon footprint. Um, but uh, but but the especially in the U.S. Um, that uh, that cost of that is not priced into the, the meat, yeah. right? So when consumers pay at the till, they're not paying for the carbon impact of that. But more and more recognizing in a lot of the you know Kyoto protocols in Paris that that pricing is going to start being put into the into the cost of the goods, right? And and indirectly it is already, um, but more directly it will be. So you know when you look at food or if you look at you know transportation and saying well petrol is has a carbon footprint that's going to start getting priced in, then things that don't have that would be cheaper. Yeah. And so from an economic perspective. The, the, the cost, the indirect cost on the planet is going to start to be something that becomes felt by consumers. And so as we talk about long-term sustainable tech, it's things that can focus on. We know that that's where the trend is going. So if you want to be on the innovative side, you start to find things that are going to, what are the businesses that are going to thrive be when some of those costs start to get priced in? And if you can be in that space, so whether it's on the food side and you know alternative proteins or plant-based, or if it's on the alternative energy or you know alternative construction, which which Ronald is going to talk about, you know if you're in that space, then there's no doubt that you're you're on the winning side, right? And that's that's what we're really excited about, as we say, you know we scout, skill, and scale. So we we're looking to discover the companies that have those ideas that are the early stages of that, help them to skill up. And then ultimately to scale their solutions across the continent and, and and really be a net exporter outside of Africa. So as I come to you, Ronald, let me just say this. Uh, t- let me just throw this in there, Philip. Just biggest spot in the works for you. If the cost, and you're right, cattle are one of the greatest polluters of the world. They they probably beat aviation and shipping combined. It's unbelievable. Yet the people in Africa and developing nations in general rely on them not just for food, but for complete livelihood. Like if you take their cattle away, you might as well take them to the slaughterhouse as well because they have no way to get around it. So if the costs of meat, if the costs of, uh, for example, just standardized subsistence farming goods and the cost of petrol is put into sustain in, into that uh, subsistence farmer's uh, consumer profile, chances are they'll get poorer than they already are. And we're not talking a bit poorer or it's in degrees of magnitude that we don't understand right now. So I'd love to hear your response to a question like that. But Ronald, talk to us about what you think innovation versus long-term inflation looks like generally. Yeah, uh, talking in an in innovator perspective, uh, I would ask one question. Are there policies that support us? Right. Yeah, because right from the beginning when you start buying raw materials, the factory taking the goods to the customer. We need we need to have policies that really can support us. Uh, maybe this would be in terms of reducing taxes, because if you buy your raw materials at a very high price, then this means we are really going to as well sell our products at a very high price, and this really affects the chain and. Yeah, so I the think. scale of the business because you, you talked about search, skill, and scale, was it? Yeah, yeah, so that's that's the scale challenge. Now let's talk about climate, and let's talk about what is that when we talk about a sustainable. And again, we're going to come back this way. We talk about sustainable tech. What is that starting with you? Yeah, uh, sustainable tech is this is where you come up with a, a technology that can really sustain itself. Uh, uh, a technology that can employ people, uh, it can bring in money, re- generate revenues, and as well as it can as well as scale using the revenues that we get. So, looking at this, uh, we look at uh, a technology whereby you're looking at support communities uh, as well as being able to create more opportunities uh, in using limited resources that you have. Uh, yeah. Startup Bootcamp Architect, 
Yeah, just to, and I just want to bolt on to what one of the things that excites us most about Ecomax. So every brick that they make has one kilogram of plastic, and this is a and, and and the dirty secret about plastic is that when you recycle it, it's actually worse than you know because it, you have to burn it, melt it down, make a new bottle, right? But of course, you don't want to just throw it away. So both options are bad. Yeah. What they're able to do now is take that and put it into a brick that's going to be a house or a school or you know a hospital. And it's going to last for a hundred plus years, and it's not. So they're re truly removing it out of the system, which is and, and putting it into something that has long term value, right? So like a re it's a repurpose. With, with it's a repurpose, right? Yeah. And that's far better yeah. than just actually trying to make another bottle out of it, right? So when and and but but the, it gets, it's hard when you're saying okay, but the, now we have to buy all the bottles from these people, from these collectors who make it. So what they've done that's been extraordinarily, you know, inspirational to us is they figured out a way to say, well, who has who has the responsibility and the cost to remove this? Coca-Cola, yeah. the water companies, the, yeah. these guys. Now they're able to go to those guys and say to them, you guys are responsible for taking this out of the way. You put it in. You, you created this thing. You've got to deal with it. And they're finding innovative partnerships where those companies are. Giving the, the raw materials to Ecomac to make the bricks. Is that right? Which brings down the cost yeah. of the bricks, uh, which brings, which makes it much more inexpensive for people to go and build homes. So you see this virtuous circle. And when we think like innovative tech, it's 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 more than just the tech. It's the business model itself around that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's something that's really amazing that these guys are doing. And 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 when we're looking out for startups that are in the space, we're saying. Don't think about just the product itself. You know, like the you know, the, think think about the whole value proposition mm -hmm. that's going to make this work and make the whole thing sustainable. A complete circular economy of sorts. So, what's happening now? And I actually want to hear this from you, Philip. Is is you're finding companies that were predominantly not inclusive to any sustainable tech circular economy vibes starting to change their business model to do it, but they're not sold into the vision. Is that what we want? I think uh, not being sold in the vision is, is a big question because right now uh, the question we'll ask is, is the pain deep enough? Is the market big enough um, to, for instance, what uh, Ronald is doing, a construction company saying, look, we need to move 180 degrees around to take this one. Mm. But we're not seeing that because it's not yet their pain. Over in Europe and the US, you've had now, um, they've got incentives. I actually got to find out there's about this Inflation Act, where right. they've, in the US, it's so, about yeah. 370 billion US dollars. In Europe, there are a lot of uh, policies that are coming that are forcing these things. Here on the continent, we're not yet there, right? And so um, uh, it's only companies that have roots in, uh, in Europe or the US that are sort of having, sort of take from headquarters, go down. Yeah. But your average uh, company here, that's not their thinking. It is lower cost at all, all costs. At, at all cost. That's it. And so the pain is not deep enough because they, the fear of passing this on to consumers here, what, what he talked about, if people took the, who consume meat having to price in the cost of carbon, mm -hmm. we're not going to eat it, no, right? No. You're going to kill it. So here we don't have uh, that yet where it is. The pain is not deep enough here. And there are alternatives, right? Um, I think one of the things that showed us a huge um, a way to go is this COVID thing. Um, both yeah. COVID as well as the, the recent uh, the ongoing Russia-Ukraine crisis. Yeah. When you all of a sudden wake up and figure out that, wait a minute, 90% of Africa's wheat Green comes, from, one comes from outside. That's insane. Now, yeah. that to me is moving towards what are local solutions uh, that we can use here. We're still not there because now, as soon as we got the vaccination, I can now sit here. Coming to Nairobi a year ago, it was mask, vaccination, tests, and all that stuff. Now that I can sit with Tony, we're back to importing from China. We're back to all our supply chains have been switched on again. So we're not yet, the pain's not diff, uh, uh, deep enough, and the market is not yet uh, still. So, so then, how, and you, to your point of um, policy, and how you, 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 I don't even know, and this is my personal opinion, so I could be wrong, and I want to hear what you think. I don't think the pain was deep enough in the US or in, the, in Europe for the companies to opt in. I think governments drove that conversation. And so it's, it, it, is it then now, to your question, a point of pain, yeah. or is it a point of policy? And how do we push it in a continent that is aware? Practical example to what you just said. So the president, on Monday, yeah. had his minister, uh, his proposed cabinet secretary or minister of 
agriculture. Start unbanning GMO that we previously had banned in Kenya for the longest time. And the previous, I, I would even say, uh, Minister of Agriculture 10, 12 years ago, um, came out uh, on, on the television set, on the news, and said, this is the worst mistake we could ever make. Because GMO tends to be self-sustaining in that you get wheat from a company we shall not name, you plant the wheat, the first grain hoard is amazing, and then it doesn't replenish itself. And then it is blown by the wind into somebody else's farm, and then it starts growing in that person's farm. And then it starts messing up because it takes more nutrients than it should. And then in 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we have a completely depleted soil, soil system because it's taking more nutrients than it It's basically a human being on steroids. The first five years, you look amazing, and then the last five years, you look like you came back from the dead. You know, it, it, it's a switch. So when you're talking about investing in sustainable tech, and, and that starts getting confused with GMO, especially because it's a top-down approach. How do we make it so that this sustainable tech is not steroids? Because that's what we're seeing now. We're seeing a lot of steroids. How do we make it so that it's not, it's not steroids? Yeah, so look, as I said, you know, so much of it is business model innovation as well as just the tech itself. Um, but there's, you know, even before you have government regulation and, and, and some of the ones you're talking about, you know, these, these political decisions, you know, are just sometimes incomprehensible. But, you know, the largest investor in the U.S. in meat alternatives is a company called Tyson Foods. Tyson Foods is also currently the largest uh, producer of meat in the world, right? Um, I mean, I would use a different word, but in a, in a polite setting. So they, but, but they see it. They have a responsibility to their shoulders to say that, hey, that they will come when, when we don't do chicken anymore, or we do far less chicken than we currently do. Um, and, 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 and they already see it dropping. So they, they see the writing on the wall. And their responsibility to their shareholders to say, well, what's, what's next? We have, to, we have to disrupt ourselves. We have to innovate. And so they are, they're investing in all of the meat alternatives, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And some of those are plant-based, some of those are lab-grown, there's a whole slew of other stuff. Um, even in Africa now, we start to see there are, in South Africa, there's a couple of these uh, you know, technology companies and, and innovation companies that are really working on these, these alternative meats. It doesn't solve the economic problem, which you were describing. That's, that's going to be something where we have to also work on that business model. You know, what do we replace those, you know, those farmers, those sharecroppers, those, their, their livelihoods, how do you replace that? And that is something that needs to be addressed. But you know, when, when we look at you know, the adoption of bricks, and you're like, okay, if cost is the driving factor, cool. How do you make your brick cheaper? And you can find the company willing to give you a, a large amount of the input, he can make them cheaper. So he can actually drive adoption and conversion on the basis of cost as a first start. And then you hope that people are like super excited to say, hey, I've got a green building, you know, maybe, I mean, at some point, you know, he's looking at like, can we, can we carbon offset, you know, this building and you get credits for that. Like maybe there's models around that. But at a starting point, you know, when lab grown meat is cheaper than the, the beef you're going to buy or the steak yeah. you're going to buy, people yeah. will eat it. Yeah. It's like, hey, it tastes the same and it's cheaper. Boom, I'm in. Okay. Right? Yeah. Um, you know, but now we'll have to figure out the rest of the economy that used to be reliant on the meat to, to sustain. Look, themselves. I mean, in, in, in the U.S., you know, candidly, I don't care, right? The, the, in Africa, industry, it's a very it's different massive. thing. Very different but thing, in the U.S., yeah. there's no sharecropping farmers out yeah. there. You know, there's no happy cows wandering in fields. Yeah, yeah. It's all mass scale commercial, right? Yeah. So that is just an abomination that needs to stop. Yeah, but true. but Africa is a very different story. Yeah, I mean, yeah. here it is. It, like you said, it is generations. It's it's actually the wealth of. I mean, in Kenya in particular, you know, the Maasai, like you know, the, I mean, the, right, the national right. herds. I mean, this is a fundamental part of the economy. Yeah. And the so as well. it's a, it's an entirely different cultural consideration. So, to you now, uh, when we talk about what he's just mentioned, there's a cultural attachment to things, right? Uh, let's talk about houses and how your your uh, especially what you're doing with bricks at Ecomark, and and the plastic. Basically, Africa has been a dumping ground for the longest time for plastic. Do you see us changing our cultural behavior and moving from cutting down trees and, and taking mud pits and putting them on our homes or using cement, which is also a big polluter, and moving to plastic-infused brick building for our properties and our skyscrapers? Do you see that happening in the future? Yeah, I think the biggest challenge with this now is uh, people's perception of character. Yeah, because there are so many questions about this technology that come on. 
uh, it will it's going to change, but it's going to take us years because we need to push on, we need to get so many voices. It, it couldn't be only me at Ikumak, but we need to have so many voices, like many young people coming up and pushing. Like I said, we still need to have policies. We still have need to have government support us. Come out, and, come out and say we need to change from this solution that they're using cement because it's polluting the environment. Let's turn and use green businesses like green brick. So when the government really comes out, it really has a voice. And uh, if you look at the African setting, uh, people always hear more their leaders. Yeah, so if we could have like such a voice, so it really needs voices, but uh, the brief is, yeah, there is change. I mean, I actually read this morning, I mean, Kenya is currently 92% of its energy is renewable. Yeah. And the push, they, there was an announcement today saying they're going to be 100% by 2030. Yeah. And so, you know, Kenya on the continent, you know, there's plenty of other countries. The one I live in is one of them where it's saying, hey, we want to, and we want to develop more, you know, less sustainability, they're pushing for, you know, more fossil fuels. Mm. Um, and Kenya is, is at the forefront. Yeah. Kenya, and from sustainability on the energy side. Yeah. So it naturally follows that you say, hey, in the built world, in the built economy, mm -hmm. that you could also be a leader. Yeah. yeah. You know, and that, that somewhat comes in policy, but it also just comes in adoption. You know, if from a, if a consumer demand is there, to say, hey, we, I would, I would love to have, I would love to be able to put on the side of my building, on the, on the entrance of my building, that this was built with plastic, right? Yeah. Seventy percent of the stuff you see in the walls it's here is all plastic. Building. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's an incredible story. Yeah, yeah. So some people will do it for PR value, right? And if you, if you nominalize, the, if, the, if the cost is the same, okay, you know, for the same dollar, you can get a seventy percent plastic brick versus a, 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 a an unsustainable saying. brick, right? Right. Of course, take yeah. it, right? Is it unfair for, for, for Europe to tell Africa to start changing when, a practical example, is it, it's called North Storm, right? North Storm, North Storm, the pipe. Yes. What's the pipe called? It's North Storm pipe. One was down last week, two is down now, right? So it's gonna be a very tough winter. What's Germany doing? Let's start up all those coal mines again. Let's, let's make it happen. And yes, it is a, a this is strenuous circumstances, things are really tough. But then in general for us, no one has ever come to heat our homes when it's raining. We're the ones, Pakistan, a, quote, a third of the country is underwater now. Like, is it unfair for developed nations that have had 400 years of, of all the uh, innovation that they've had, and sometimes at the expense of African countries using colonization, to build themselves where they are, to now to look at Africa and be like, you need to be sustainable, cop this, cop that. Is it unfair? Um, the unfairness of it, I, I, I wouldn't be a judge, um, but certainly I think there are merits uh, to it. What, what's happening right now in Europe, those, that to me is more risk, lack of risk mitigation, right? This, no one saw this coming, right? They're all moving that direction. But I think when you look at the emitters, Africa is one of the <laughs> least emitters, right? We, we were not there. And so again, that's to the point of uh, why emit. I think there is also over in Uganda the whole raging debate about ECOP, the, the pipeline um, that, that's, that's happening right now. But that said, I, I think for, for much of uh, Europe, they, there is, they have at least the, the regulation and the incentive. When, again, not Europe, but over in the US, when you put $370 billion to moving people to buy electric vehicles, to uh, reduce your fuel bills. Look, Ruto came out the other day and said, look, government, we are broke. Yeah. Other people have kitty bags, right, where they can dip into or they can at least print. We can't here. Um, and so here it is looking at what, 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 is con what can we contextualize for ourselves here. I'll give an example here, and I like what this is here. It's not just around tech, it's innovating inv and investing. Well, so long, in long term. Long term. Yeah. Now, that, that is, is not necessarily software, there's also the hardware to side of things, which, which is uh, to the point what uh, Ronald is talking about. I'll give the example over in Rwanda. Several years ago, they just came out right and said, no more plastics, right? It was painful. It still is painful, right? Uh, because uh, plastic is still the most cheapest, most hygienic way of taking a pro uh, what I produce from me to you, right? Yeah. It's still, it still is. Yeah. The alternatives are there, right? They use cellulose based, all this kind of stuff, but that is five times the cost of the product. Yeah, correct. Again, yeah. my consumers here are not going to have that. So I think there's still space uh, there when you look at from the built area to the, uh, in, in our, our space as well, it's an FMCG. 
So when I look at your back to your question around what uh, Europe is doing, of course it is. They're they're are they're one of the biggest polluters, and now they're having to fire up all, all those. But it does have an impact here. Again, we have COP twenty seven coming up uh, yeah, yeah. very ne- soon. Uh, very soon. Yeah. And I'm hoping some of what is on the ground here can, it's difficult for them. Of course, the last couple of years they've been saying, look, we'll pay for it to, uh, we'll pay for the developing world not to go down that route. But hey, you've, you've seen the Little. last, it, it, it hasn't happened. We saw with those COVID vaccines, I went. I it don't went. know if they'll be And so stuff. after seeing what happened in COVID, yeah. there is not a leader in African continent that with their weight and goal that's going to believe that. Ooh, yeah, Philip. The, I think the, the issue is that there's, um, well, I'll take a step back and just say the perspective that we try to encourage is this is the opportunity. We, 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 are, we are at a at a transformative moment, right? It is truly a watershed moment. And Africa has inherent has an inherent advantage in this, leap, this concept of leapfrog. Like we were the, the leaders in the world in jumping into, you know, 4G and 5G mobile much faster than the rest of the world because the, not so much 5G, but 4G was in, in many parts of Africa. The very first mobile services that came online were, you know, 3G, 4G, exactly. right? Yeah. And so the, the leapfrog something. We there. leapfrog because we didn't have to come from a huge infrastructure of installed copper lines everywhere mm-hmm. and whatever. It was like, hey, we just jump straight into the next thing. So because we already have this vast, you know, tracks of, of land. You know, the idea of running cables and trying to do traditional power across that doesn't make sense. Yeah. Localized microgrids make sense. Solar powered, wind powered, you know, thermal powered makes sense. And we can actually, you know, we're the environment where you're not having to replace a legacy system. In many cases, there is no energy solution there. Mm. So use that to our advantage, right? Take the opportunity to go and build something in places where the market is demanding it, where there's a high need for it, you know? And that's why we see innovative business models like pay as you go for electricity on, on little solar, you know, micro entrepreneurs, you know, out in rural parts of Africa. That's that's an awesome opportunity. Hot swappable, uh, you know, batteries in, in motos, you know, that's an awesome opportunity, you know, that you can see that people can, you know, establish, you know, microgrids or distributed mesh networks of, of, of power all across the continent. Yeah. Like we can be the leader, yeah. and that's yeah. really the mindset. It's like, you know, yes, okay, should they, should anybody be telling us to do it? No, of course not. But, but whether they should or they shouldn't, we can make a lot of money. So it's a we narrative can, that we, needs we, to we change, can we I can say. be at the forefront. Yeah, like we can this start is, something instead of yes. following something, and we can and we can be the. the the dominant players, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, M Pesa, you know, was really, uh, really just a, a business model wrap and a brand wrapped around a practice that was already in place here. I mean, the, you know, just individuals solving, you know, the need to be able to get money or airtime out to their rural parts. They solved that themselves. M Pesa came along, but it was like ten years later that Tim Cook stood on the stage at CES and said, "Hey, at Apple, we've invented, you know." You, mobile money or Apple Pay, you know, like, hey, you can, you know, now you can take your phone and look at this cool, you can like swipe it around and there's all this expensive stuff and kind of, we were looking at it like, man, we've been doing this for like 15 like, years. Yeah. yeah, we do it on SMS. We have USSD, like we don't, you know, you know, thousand dollar phone and all this tech, you know, but, but Africa didn't take that narrative. They didn't tell the story. They didn't go out and say, hey, we've invented something super cool. The rest of the world, you guys should get on board. Look how awesome this is. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, it just doesn't happen. So we can do that with energy. We can do that with some of these sustainable technologies and say, look, we're, we're solving this problem in a way that's better than what you guys are doing, mm-hmm. and we want to export it to you. Questions? Does anyone have something they want to ask that uh, we could be able to wrap it up with? No? I see. Yes, there's one there. Let's go. Uh, What is the role of the carbon credit market in this conversation? Yeah, so so for those who don't know, just basically, you know, most of the countries have now signed on to these these commitments and saying, hey, you know, we're going to meet certain targets, and globally, globally, we have to hit these targets. And a lot of companies now are also doing the same thing. So if you're an airline, you can't run your your planes today on something that's not producing a lot of carbon, right? So you're above your limit. So the way to offset that is you go out to someone who's planting trees and say, "Hey, your plant, your your field, or your you know your your farm out there, you're taking carbon out of the thing, but you you're taking you're below your threshold. So that difference between where you are and what you're allowed to do is considered a credit. 
and there's now a marketplace where you can go and buy and sell those credits. So if you are underneath the thresholds, then you can get paid by people that are over the threshold, and it nets out to zero, right? And that's how the targets are. So cool companies, uh, we have another company uh, in our portfolio that's, that's sort of called Power Stove, they make cook stoves, and they went out and they, in Africa, and you know, cook stoves are a great thing, but they use a clean burning pellet. And they're like, hey, so a family of four using our cook stove over the course of a year is far less carbon putting into the atmosphere than people that are cooking over an open fire or charcoal briquettes, et cetera. So they got a carbon offset. So now the cook stove, they can sell for $8, but they can get $10 per year over a five-year lifespan. That's a $50 carbon credit that they get paid by the, by the marketplace, by some airline out there, by some other company, is paying this company $50 for every stove that only costs them $8 to produce. Right? That's an entirely it, new business model. Isn't that just cheating? It's, it's phenomenal. But isn't it cheating? No, no, no. It's not no, cheating it's not, at all. It's not it's, cheating? No, 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 no. Because look, th there's no the, the, the point is that the atmosphere doesn't care where the carbon is coming from. Yeah. Right? So if there's one airline that's producing too much, but there's a forest that's producing less, and the net result is that, w that, that globally we're reducing it, that's just that's just economic value. So as long as the, the forest remains yes. foresty. Yes. Yes. So so you can't touch the forest. This is this is a good question because if I, if I could. I would, let me, in fact, I, I'm coming to you quickly. Calm down. Because you see what's happening with the Amazon. Yeah. Did you see what's happened with the Amazon? I was watching Bishop Quest and he asked the question which I'm going to ask you now. Yeah. Isn't it community hijack by corporates? Because if, for example, using this example of yours that you have given, that is really wise, the Brazilian government sells um, the Amazon carbon credits to whatever, whether it's World Bank or WTA, whatever. If it offers it up for, I think they're doing it for auction, yeah. so you can be able to purchase a, a, you know, a percentage of that. And they're putting it out like an IPO. Yeah. Then that means that the local folk living next to the Amazon are legally not allowed to get in there and do what they have culturally been doing, whether it's gathering, uh, what's fallen down, or do, uh, I think they call it intricate farming or something, where you find a little space in the Amazon and you do some farming. And, and so that's basically said, you locals who live and rely on this ecosystem have been banned because a corporate company somewhere is paying for this forest to be able to offload carbon credit. Yeah. Now you can go. If, if, if I may, the carbon market, I think, is one of the biggest opportunities going into the future, right? Because it's a problem that is not going to go away. We are cooking, right? The, whatever you want to say, whether you're in uh, Pakistan or whatever, it's, it's happening. And the opportunity to then be able to, yes, it, it does look like a, um, what did you call it, a community hijacking, but it's also an opportunity for them, right, to earn a living. Again, if there's states and governments trickles down, that is, and, and that, that's, no, that, that's not for me to say. The, the, the principle is it was supposed to, right? But I think the opportunity for those who have land to be able to say, look, we will we'll offset this one. And one of the companies I was mentioned to Philip yesterday that uh, in one that's looking at is similar, where they're doing more uh, your spatial, they can count your number of trees on your, using spatial technology, your trees on your farm and say, okay, we'll model and say, this takes up so much carbon, therefore we can sell it on, on to, uh, to the Amazon airlines, right? And that's using uh, I mean, some technology there, fancy technology. But I think it is an opportunity because we, you're not going to stop flying, right? But you can stop cutting your trees and benefit as an offset. So someone can receive that as a, as a dividend, right? So they, that opportunity is, is there. And it's, it's not going away. And I think that to me is a place where Africa can play. My biggest issue is the complexity in getting to the Amazon's understanding is a huge unknown. Not many companies know what that is because when you look at the UN, for, first of all, from the Kyoto Protocols, now there's the Paris Agreement. Um, they finally agreed that one. There's how do you get the, the different persons that need to be able to certify that this is uh, valid the capture of this. We don't yet have in within governments that infrastructure, right. and I think that's an opportunity for guys like uh, PwC and others to say, look, this is how we're going to help the states be able to validate that. In the US, I think Ver. Versa, there's a Vera out in the American, uh, yes, American Registry of Government. So they, 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 we don't have one on the African content as well. So these are kind of opportunities right. to be able to validate. Someone needs to be able to validate that. Yes. The other issue was if uh, I sell my carbon to Amazon, mm -hmm. what's the? I should not be able to sell it to uh, Shell, BP. Yeah, yeah. 
And one, now that you talk of Shell, I think uh, one of the things that I saw, I think two years ago, this one of the uh, the Dutch courts fined Shell. Furniture. No, no, not furniture. For, for the, uh, again, around this carbon. And when they computed it, for Shell and Exxon, those are the two biggest ones, there's not enough carbon credit to go around. So I think in getting... Globally? Globally. Huh. He's not yeah, and, that, and that's why there's such an opportunity. So, so yeah. to go back to this Amazon, the problem was that prior to this scenario, mm. the, the, the forests were being cut down that's because true. the forests have no value in and of themselves. I mean, they have, we all conceptually agree to the value. Yes, yeah, so it's really important. But, but until you can put a price tag on a dollar value. So big companies were coming in and cutting down the forest to make fields for cattle to sell beef and hamburgers to U.S. consumers. Which have a dollar value. Right, which has a dollar value. The only way you're going to stop that is not like outrage and protest and, hey, please don't do this and our kids and blah, blah, blah. The only way to stop it is to say there's more value in leaving that tree standing yeah. than to cut it down for your hamburger, mm. right? And it's that's dollar value versus dollar value. Yeah. And so those communities, yeah. absolutely, there's, this, this is not a perfect solution. They're being, you know, perhaps disadvantaged. But previously they were losing the forest anyway. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah. They're, they're, they're not, I mean, they're small victims, like, but globally, the victim is all of us. Yeah. And until you can provide a economic value to reduce your carbon, right, to plant the tree, to make a clean cook stove, to make a clean brick, brick yeah. like he's not going to do, nobody's going to be doing it if they can't sell the products, right? For all the goodness and the greenwashing and the, you know, the, 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 let's, let's all be, you know, sing kumbaya, you know, th there has to be a dollar, an, incent an economic incentive. And that's what the carbon markets do is they provide to say, hey, Shell needs to buy more than all of the carbon carbon all the current carbon credits in the world. So hey, it's a really good business. There's there's more demand than there is supply. So go and figure out a way to carbon credit your product. Yeah. You know, and if you can do that, then boom, like you've got an additional interesting innovative business model. You know, like he can make bricks that are cool. If he can also add a carbon credit, you know, bonus on top of that, even cooler. It's cooler. Right? And it's cheaper and it does overcome long-term inflation. If you yeah, remember yeah. back in the day when they used, your parents used to tell you money doesn't grow on trees. <laughs> now, now it does. does. Now that's good. Yeah, I, saw uh, I saw that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe to add something is... Yes or no? We still have a very huge opportunity and me, I think, yeah, bring down carbon credits is really nice for us. If you move around, you find so many trees have been cut down for firewood, uh, for making buildings, charcoal yeah but if you know and so many people have big farmlands where they do the other activities like grazing mm -hmm. so if you come we still have people young people could come on and say hey if you use 10 acres of your land plant trees on it you're going to be selling your carbon credit yeah yeah so uh we still now going to see a, the green africa we need to see yeah. because people are longer going to cut their trees for firewood mm -hmm. and people are all as well going to be turning to green solutions like green brick I can't wait to see a carbon carbon credit market. You know, like the way you have Binance for or, or Binance for, for for crypto. Can't wait to see something like that that's globally adopted. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big shout out to the gents and the conversation. Thank you so much.